Hello friends, I am Dr. Rajesh Chokhania, General Pediatrician from Bandra, Mumbai and today we will be talking about diarrhea. So diarrhea is not just loose stools. We need to consider a change in frequency and consistency of stool from the usual which signifies diarrhea. We all know that breastfed infants often pass stools which are frequent and a little loose in consistency. But as long as the stools are golden yellow, small in quantity and not foul smelling and the infant is active, playful and feeding well, it does not signify a disease and does not need treatment. On another note, children often present with loose stools which are actually trickling along hard impacted fecal masses in the intestines and therefore these children don't have diarrhea but they are actually suffering from constipation. As usual, we first need to define the anatomy of diarrhea. In most cases, the anatomy is the intestine, but occasionally we do come across cases of what are known as parenteral diarrhea, where the cause of the diarrhea lies outside the intestine, that is parenteral. This is sometimes seen in infants and toddlers who suffer from UTI or otitis media. Clinically, we recognize this as an abnormal sequence of events, that is, they present with fever and loose stools, but the loose stools stop unexpectedly, but the fever continues and later we find out the actual cause of the fever. Now, diarrhea due to small intestinal disease is large and watery. This is because in addition to the orally ingested fluids, a lot of water is secreted into the small intestine and then reabsorbed. Since reabsorption is affected in a disease state, the stools are large and watery. As against this, large intestinal diarrhea is small in quantity because after the small intestinal reabsorption, only 15% of the fluid is presented to the large intestine and that's why the stools are small in quantity. In addition, they are very frequent and they contain blood and mucus frequently. Chronic small intestinal diarrhea presents with malabsorption and loss of weight because very important nutrients have not been absorbed for a long period of time. Chronic large intestinal diarrhea presents with hypoproteinemia in a sick child who has loss of weight and loss of appetite as is seen in inflammatory bowel disease. How does associated features help us in deciding the pathology and etiology of diarrhea? Fever and pain suggest inflammation which is often seen in infective but is at times seen in non-infective diarrheas like inflammatory bowel disease. So, if a patient presents with a longer history of repeated episodes of fever, pain and bloody diarrhea, we should suspect inflammatory bowel disease rather than taking it as recurrent bacillary dysentery. In an acute short illness, high fever favors a bacterial infection while uh, sometimes viral infections may also have high fever. Bacillary dysentery is often preceded by very high fever, which is poorly responsive to antipyretics. It is only after the patient starts passing loose stools that the fever starts coming down. Low fever is often favoring a viral infection, but it might as well be a bacterial infection. When vomiting is there at the beginning of the illness, it signifies gastroenteritis, which in turn signifies that it's a viral infection. Vomiting which persists beyond one or two days or which comes up later in the course of the illness is to be taken seriously because it may suggest a complication. Crampy abdominal pain is much more severe in bacterial infections but milder pain can be seen even in viral infections. Tenismus is a sign of bacillary dysentery. Associated cold and cough suggests a viral infection. It must be noted that intestinal tuberculosis is not a mucosal disease and therefore it does not present with diarrhea as the chief complaint. It's a submucosal disease where the fibrosis and stricture formation lead to subacute intestinal obstruction. So the classic description of this condition in books is of alternating constipation and diarrhea which means the patient will actually present with prolonged periods of infrequent stools which may intermittently be marked by diarrhea due to infection. The etiology of diarrhea is usually infective, but we must also consider non-infective causes. So inflammatory bowel disease is the example of non-infective bloody diarrhea, whereas irritable bowel syndrome, 
food poisoning, antibiotics, and hyperthyroidism are examples of non-infective, non-bloody diarrhea. In these cases, it may just be increased frequency of stools or it may be actually loose stools. When stools are more frequent, but there is a lot of fecal matter in the stools and they are loose, this may signify just a motility problem. So the clinical patterns of diarrhea can be summarized as large watery diarrhea in a well-nourished infant, viral infection, watery diarrhea in an older child, food poisoning, uh, blood and mucus in stools, bacillary dysentery, rice water, large quantity of frequent stools, cholera, longer period of blood and mucus in stools, inflammatory bowel disease, large foul smelling greyish stools, giardiasis, loose stools off and on with the patient normal in between, irritable bowel syndrome. The degree of dehydration has to be assessed by history by taking into account the frequency and amount of motions as well as by examination. Severe dehydration, abdominal distension, change in behavior in the form of irritability or lethargy and oliguria are red flags that suggest the need for hospitalization. In a malnourished child, the threshold for hospitalization should be lower. From the management point of view, the clinician has to basically divide the diarrheas into acute watery diarrheas and diarrhea with blood and mucus in stools. Acute watery diarrhea can be viral as in rotaviral or bacterial example E. coli or cholera. Replacement of the ongoing losses by using WHO approved ORS is the preferred fluid of choice and it is the mainstay of treatment. Home alternatives like salt and sugar solution with fresh lime that is nimbu pani or coconut water or fresh buttermilk may be acceptable alternatives. But glucose water or aerated drinks or fruit juices with added sugar are not acceptable. Even if the child is vomiting, rehydration must be attempted by giving the child sip by sip of these liquids. Obviously, when the provisional diagnosis is a viral infection, antibiotics are not required. But when watery loose stools are due to a bacterial infection, even if we were to start antibiotics, it won't help because these loose motions are toxin mediated and the toxin has already been released. So it is only after the toxin gets washed out that these loose motions will automatically reduce and stop. So the antibiotic won't make any difference. When there is blood and mucus in stool, it indicates a bacterial infection and it needs antibiotics. Amoebic dysentery is very uncommon in children and should not be considered primarily in acute diarrheas. The, so the decision to use or withhold antibiotics is largely clinical. Stool microscopy is not required usually and stool culture is never required routinely. It is indicated only in chronic malnourishing diarrhea. The presence of reducing substances in stool merely indicates a transient lactose intolerance which is going to get better in one or two days on its own. It does not necessitate cessation of breastfeeding nor does it need a change in the formula to a lactose free formula except in a malnourished child. Milk and milk products need not be stopped and there is no need for any restriction or change in the diet because rehydration and nutrition is the mainstay of treatment of diarrhea. Only in adults, milk and milk products may be restricted in this uh, condition, in this situation. Probiotics do not have a proven beneficial role as of now in acute diarrheas. Chronic diarrheas are merely a case of mismanaged acute diarrheas very often and that leads to dehyd um, sorry, malnutrition which perpetuates the condition. There could be some other causes of chronic diarrhea but this is a topic by itself which we may discuss at some other time. So to summarize friends, diarrhea diagnosis and management is largely clinical, largely supportive with minimal use of antibiotics in very select situations. Thank you. The next topic will be on constipation, 
गट इन स्लो मोशन बाय डॉक्टर आर डी खरे